Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Benjamin Law. I'm a screenwriter and a journalist, and I'm very honoured to be here on Aotearoa um, as a visitor who lives in the great Aboriginal Eora Nation on which the Australian city of Sydney is now built. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here at The Power of Inclusion, uh, listening to and frankly spying on the ways uh, so many of you here are breaking barriers and making history through storytelling on screen. And though it's not a competition, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find someone breaking down more barriers than uh, our guest today. He's made one of um, my favourite TV dramas of the past decade, It's All About Me. Um, if Not All Time, uh, which centres on the New York ballroom scene of the 1980s and the 1990s. It's about LGBTIQA plus community and family. It's a show that's given me comfort, a strong sense of history, belonging and solidarity, and also just made me really want to dress the hell up. And I'm sure it's had that effect on a lot of you here today too. It's a hugely pioneering show. It has the largest cast of transgender actors in TV history. Its creator, who we're about to meet, is the first Latinx producer to be nominated for an Emmy in the Outstanding Drama category. And in fact, this year the show was up for six Emmy nominations, including a win for the incredible and iconic Billy Porter in the lead actor category for his portrayal of Pray Tell, yes. And that show, of course, is the FX drama Pose. Its creator, executive producer, writer and director was named by Variety as a TV writer to watch last year, but given the series has now been renewed for its third season, I think it's fair to say that we're not going to stop watching him or his work anytime soon. So please join me in welcoming to the power of inclusion and indeed uh, Aotearoa, Stephen Canals. Welcome, Stephen. Thank it's so you. exciting to have you here. Lovely to be here. We've it's got a lot morning. to talk about, and there will be time to take questions uh, from the directions that you uh, were given before. And Stephen, before we get into Pose, um, its creation story and its effect on so many conversations around the world, I want to hear a bit about you growing up. Before you were a creator, you would have been a consumer. You would have been... Um, exposed to stories that, that resonated with you. So can you tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up as a black, Latinx, queer youth in the 1980s? Um, and what, if any, queer stories uh, you consumed in, in pop culture? Well, spoiler alert, there were no queer stories. <laughs> um, growing up in the 80s in New York City, in housing projects in the midst of both the HIV AIDS and crack epidemics, it was a really difficult time. It was a bleak time for New York. Um, and my parents who were very young, um, you know, bless their hearts, worked really hard, um, you know, quite diligently to, to shield me and to protect me from what was happening outside. But, you know, for a young, inquisitive, hyper aware child, like there's only so much you can protect, and and so I was very aware that we were we were living in a really difficult place mm. and time. So that's a really rough um, era and area. It sounds like where did where did you find solace? Were there stories that you took comfort in? Well, I mean, the two places I would say that I definitely found solace. One was in front of the television, uh -huh. um, and the other was at night because my mom, who is a kindergarten teacher, loved to read to me. And so I always found um, solace in, in story. Mm -hmm. And what were you growing up uh, hearing in terms of those stories and watching when it came to television? Well, my mom was a big one for either making stories up uh -huh. um, or just reading to me. Like, I loved the Berenstain Bears. That was probably one of my favorites as a little boy. Um, and then in terms of, of content, what's really fascinating is, again, my parents were in their early 20s when they had me. And so, and I know so the parents out there, you may feel like this is terrible parenting, but <laughs> my parents allowed me to watch everything and anything. Uh -huh. There really wasn't a limit. And so whatever content I was consuming, we would just have a conversation about it. This is so interesting because when we were growing up, there was that kind of broader narrative that too, too much TV rots your brains. Now TV is kind of associated with high culture. I grew up in a household hmm 
where there wasn't much distinction between high or low culture. Like if it was on the screen, you could watch it. Did you grow up in a similar way? No, I don't know that, that we, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, but you were allowed to consume whatever you wanted. Absolutely. And Absolutely. that, I mean, looking back, was that, did that mean that was a good education for you? Because I kind of always feel, you know, very um, justified, smugly, that we got to watch so much television because ending up working in television, that's the type of literacy that you need later on. Yeah, but I think to go back to your early question, see, I grew up in a family where my, see, my, both my parents grew up in Harlem. Mm -hmm. Um, and this was in the 60s and 70s, and they grew up in very abusive households. And so I think when my parents had me, well, not I think, I know that when my parents had me, they really wanted to end that cycle of abuse. Mm. Um, and also just to change the metaphorical narrative, if you will, for me. And so, desp again, despite the fact that New York was really bleak at the time that I was born, and we really had very little resources, um, as a family, uh, you know, they were really great about encouraging me. So the television wasn't seen as rotting your brain. Like it wasn't mm. problematic that I wanted to spend hours and hours in front of TV. I think that they felt like, thankfully, he doesn't want to be outside. <laughs> so there was that. Yeah. Um, and I think they just were excited to encourage me and whatever my interests were. And my interest as a child was, was television. And then at what point did you think, actually stories are something that I'd like to tell? A bunch of your friends and you in your teen years got together to start making documentaries, is that right? So I had no idea that I would ever be in the place and the position that I am in now. Um, and frankly, if you had said this to me even eight years ago, I would have said you were insane, um, but when I was 15, an after-school program called Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice started in my high school, um, and this was in the South Bronx, and I'm assuming most of you probably are not super familiar with New York, but um, the late 1970s, New York was coming out of the heroin epidemic. Mm -hmm. We then promptly stepped foot into uh, the crack epidemic of the 80s. Um, we had Ronald Reagan as a president who really did absolutely nothing um, for the LGBTQIA plus community, did nothing for uh, people of color, um, and certainly only ever came to the Bronx once, and this was prior to his initial election mm -hmm. as president where he claimed he was gonna help the community and then didn't. And so, Going into the 90s, we step out of these epidemics, um, or the crack epidemic, I would say HIV AIDS was, was still running rampant. Um, and then gang violence emerged mm -hmm. in our community. And so a group of my classmates and I, I was 14 going on 15 at the time, this was in the very early 90s, um, decided to join this after school program and work on a documentary short about turf violence, which at the time, uh, HBO Family was a nascent network and they were going to fund this project. Mm. And so we had college age students come into our high school and they worked with us. They taught us about story and about structure and about filmmaking. And then we spent seven, about seven or eight months working on constructing a narrative, going out and interviewing classmates and interviewing individuals who were living in housing projects, folks who were gang members. Um, and then we edited this piece, and about a week, a little less than a week before we were completed editing this project, one of my classmates, Ava, um, was shot and killed. Um, and her body was found across the street from our high school. And, and to this day, it's a cold case, like her, her murder was never found. And at 15, to go from uh, highlighting an experience to then suddenly having the experience was really informative for me. And I knew at that point that I was going to devote my entire life specifically to story and elevating the lives of people who often don't have a voice and mm. don't have the platform or the privilege to share their story. Wow, what an... In So that experience, as much as it sounds like um, a grief-stricken and traumatic one, was a galvanizing thing for you um, and a motivating force. What are the next steps that you take to pursue that mission statement? 
That's a great question because I, I at that point I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker. Uh-huh. This was again ninety four, ninety five, and Steven Zalian, who's a screenwriter, and Steven Spielberg had released uh, Schindler's List that year. Um, and so I, in my mind, thought, okay, I'm going to be the next great filmmaker with the name Steven. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm going to move, I'm going to move to Hollywood, and and I'm going to make that happen. Uh-huh. Um, and so I decided I was going to study cinema, and so I mo- I studied film as an okay. undergrad at Binghamton University, which is in upstate New York, and it's an experimental film program. Mm-hmm. So for those folks who are ex- familiar with experimental film, we were watching films by Stan Brakhage and Maya Deren. Um, and it was great, it was really formative, and in many ways I think I found a version of my voice through the program. Um, but again, this was a program that really shunned uh, Hollywood um, and mainstream cinema, so we weren't interested, or my professors were not interested in beginnings, middles, and endings. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, being in my early, you know, late teens, early 20s, at that point, I just didn't have the emotional intelligence to deal with professors who were telling me, your work isn't good enough. You know, and now I look back on that experience and I I think the version of me that sits here today, had I gone through the program, I would have taken so much more out of it Mm. and would have recognized that some of those critiques, even if they were really harsh, were in an effort to help me to hone my voice as an artist. But at the time, I just felt like, why are these professors so mean? And why are they not understanding what I'm trying to create? Um, And I'm just an artist. And (laughs) it was very angsty and dramatic. And so, you know, I just, I graduated from the program and decided Uh I don't, I don't love film anymore. Okay. And that was really scary for someone who, again, had been a consumer since he was knee high to a grasshopper, um, and and then decided at 15, that's the thing I'm gonna pursue. And so at 24, you know, leaving the academy, I was like, I feel like I have no direction. Wow, what a deflating thing to go through. And then do you find that fire through some other means? What what reactivates you? Honestly, students, I mean, education has always been such a large part of my life. Again, my mom is a kindergarten teacher, um, and so I spent a lot of time, especially in high school, in the classroom with her. Mm-hmm. In the summers, I would volunteer as, a, as an aide. Um, and for a little while, I thought I would be a teacher. And I, not recognizing that I'd spent years uh, as an undergrad building a resume as a paraprofessional, because I had been a resident assistant in the residence halls or dorms, Um, and I was also an orientation advisor. And so when I graduated from college, I decided I don't want to do film, and I had to do something. And the one thing that I knew for sure is I didn't want to move back in with my parents. Uh, And so I decided I'll work in higher education as a college administrator. Mm -hmm. And so I did that for the better part of um, eight years. And it was while working with students and sitting behind a desk and talking to them and their parents about their time in the academy and, you know, what their goals were, what they wanted to accomplish over these four or five years as a student, and certainly what they were going to go out into the world and do, it's when I started to, it just re-energized me, Mm -hmm. and it really forced me to think about my own journey and what I wanted to accomplish, and that I had very specific goals, and so when I made the decision to leave the academy to pursue film and television again, and, th- and this time around as, as opposed to directing, but specifically as a writer, um, it really came from a place of me looking at the art as being another version of a classroom. Mm. Now, forgive me, Stephen, if I jump in chronology or if this is too much of a digression, mm. but I want to ask you, at what point in all of this story are you exposed to the documentary Paris is Burning for the first oh. time? So we rewind uh-huh. uh, to Binghamton University, and I, at that point, was not out, but I had a professor who was a visiting professor. She was, um, I think she had been working on her PhD at Cornell, and she had us screen the documentary Paris is Burning, Jenny Livingston's landmark piece, um, and then we read cr- two critiques, mm-hmm. the Bell Hooks and then the Judith Butler critique of the documentary. And it just blew 
my mind. Can I just stop you there? Can yeah. we just take a quick snap poll? Like, put up your hand if you've seen Paris is Burning, so you know what we're talking about. For those of you who are burning in shame with your hands down, <laughs> uh, can we just do like a quick pricey? What is Paris is Burning? It's this beautiful documentary that was filmed over three years, from 1986 to 1989, and it highlights the queer trans, black and Latinx subculture called the underground ball culture um, that is based in Harlem in New York City. And it's this beautiful community of, of trans and queer people who were rejected by families, by the government, um, and created uh, a chosen family, which they called a house. Um, and every, it actually didn't happen as often as we thought, but in the 80s, it was like every two to three months these houses would come together and they would throw these lavish balls where house members from competing houses would go on the dance floor, or, or the ballroom floor rather, um, and compete in all these categories rooted in fashion and music and dance um, for trophies and glory and occasionally some, some pocket money. So as much as it was um, a culture unto itself, it also provided for some people an infrastructure for family as well, is that right? It was family and I think even maybe more crudely, ballroom culture was and in many ways still is just a safety net mm. for queer and trans people who often are navigating the world without any actual space uh -huh. that is theirs. And so you watch this documentary, essentially what you're watching is a culture that was growing parallel to you that was not too far from where you were when you were growing up. And what does that do to your mind as you're reading the criticism, watching the film? I'm gonna take what you said a step further. It uh -huh. wasn't just that I was reading a parallel culture, I think I was, or watching, I was actually seeing myself. Mm. Because up until that point, I had been fighting coming out of the closet um, and I had never seen queer or trans people of color represented in any way mm. in media. And so Paris is Burning, the fact that, that the ballroom community took place just around the corner from where my parents grew up in Harlem and that I'd never heard about this culture, um, it just, you know, the, the thing that I took away and I always take this away whenever I watch the documentary is that I was growing up in so much shame and internalized homophobia and fear. And for the first time in my life, I saw queer and trans people of color navigating the world with so much strength and courage. And they've taught me so much about resilience. And my feeling was if in the 1980s, you could walk as a queer or trans person in the face of poverty and violence and disease, and still live in your authentic truth, I had no excuse to not come out of the closet. Mm. And so you are exposed to this documentary, this world, this culture. What does that do to you as a writer? What do you want to do with this story that you've now seen? It's fascinating because at the time, I, I very distinctly remember walking back to my residence hall room after watching the documentary and thinking, that would make a really great television show, mm. and I can't wait to watch it. <laughs> Truly. Genuinely remember watching that, and, and, or thinking that. And I remember, because um, I grew up loving Flashdance, yeah. the film Flashdance, and, and I watch it at least once a year, because I'm that kind of gay. And so <laughs> I, I just remember thinking, oh, it would be about like a young black boy who moves to New York and gets enmeshed in this war between two house mothers. I and that, that was the kernel of the idea. That's all it was. Mm. And again, like I said, remember thinking, I'd watch that. Yeah. Never thought that I would be the person to then write it and bring it to airwaves. And so what changes, ever. what changes your mind? At what point do you start getting to work on what would eventually be the pilot episode of what we now know is Pose, the, the show that you wanted to watch. So bloop, we'll flash forward <laughs> to it is now, so that happened in 2004 that I watched the documentary and I had this, this moment of, that would make a great show. Cut to 2014, I'm now in my second year at UCLA's MFA screenwriting program and I'm at the very tail end of my third year. So this is March of 2014 and I'm taking a television pilot writing class um, and this is only the second pilot that I've ever written. Um, and my mind is a desert wasteland. 
so I really have no ideas. And one of the things that I was taught when I worked in higher education is that you as an administrator have a responsibility. Any college campus that you step foot on to assess the landscape, identify where there are gaps in programs, in resources, in policies, mm -hmm. and then you use your knowledge, your platform, your privilege to then inform filling those gaps. And so I bring that with me into my practice as a screenwriter. So I go into this class, I have no ideas, I'm like, I don't know what I'm gonna write, but I do my assessment of the landscape, and at that point, so again, this is, we're coming out of 2013, going into 2014, television in America was being, and it was really around the world, was being dominated by straight, white, mm -hmm. cisgendered men, right? So it was your Breaking Bads and your, your Mad Men. Mm -hmm. And I was like, like just really tired of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was like, what, you know, what's, what else is out there? What's new, what's fresh, what's interesting? And in the program, one of the things they tell us quite a bit ad nauseum is write the show that you would want to watch, you know, find yourself, locate yourself in the narrative, tell your story. And the one idea that I sort of had in my back pocket was about this young boy named Damon who moves to New York and gets enmeshed in ball culture. And I thought, I don't know that I'm the writer to tell this story. I don't think I'm good enough. And spoiler alert, I still feel this way now. Like, I don't know that it's something that I won't ever work through. And so for the other storytellers here, specifically writers, um, like that um, imposter syndrome and that feeling like a fraud as a writer, like anytime I have to write something new, I'm constantly picking up my screenwriting books and like it's as if I've forgotten how to do it. And, like I don't remember <laughs> and I have to reacquaint myself with the process. Um, Can you unpack that a little bit more sure. for us? Because uh, for all of us who have seen Pose and also seen the accolades that it's gotten, um, you know, it's been one of the most praised film, uh, praised dramas that's come out uh, in the last 10 years. 10 years, you've spearheaded that, but that sense of inadequacy, like what, what is the source of that? Or is it actually something that you can harness in your craft, that sense of anxiety forces you mm -hmm. to take extra steps to make sure the show's great? I think it's just called being an artist uh -huh. and being a human, you know? Like I think anybody who navigates life that confident, like I don't trust you. Um, <laughs> You know, um, I just, yeah, I just, I don't buy that. So, uh, yeah, and I, I just, I, I navigate life with anxiety, I think like most people do. Mm -hmm. I, I think what's important though, because it, throughout my 20s, because I don't think it's by chance that I moved to LA when I was 32, mm -hmm. I sold Pose a week after my 36th birthday, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't think it's by chance that I, it was in my, mid to late 30s that now this career has happened, yeah. you know? I, I think I needed to step into myself, but I also needed to, to figure out what were the tools to lower the volume yeah. in my voice. And I think that's the advice I would give to any artist out there, because I think, again, most people here probably navigate life with anxiety. And, and for me, in my 20s, fear specifically was very incapacitating and was uh, controlling a lot of my decisions. And I think in my 30s, I stepped into myself in a way where the fear hasn't gone away. Um, there's something that Elizabeth Gilbert says in her book, Big Magic, where she says, um, whenever I'm traveling in her, you know, her creativity is like a car, and so she's in the front seat, and fear is still in the car, she just tells fear, you have to sit in the back seat, buckle in, and shut up. <laughs> and I think that that's how I navigate my life now. Like, I've figured out what the tools are to turn the volume down on the noise, yeah. but the noise is still there. The noise doesn't go away. Stephen, you mentioned something so wonderfully matter-of-factly just then, which is at 36, you sold Pose. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that happen? So you've, by that stage, you've got a pilot script for, and how closely is it to what we actually see on screen? And what conversations are you having with people to try to get it to the next step? to get it made, because you can write the most wonderful script in the world, but the next step of actually turning it into something that we see on screen is incredibly difficult. What was your process? So I write the first draft, as I said, in 2014, mm -hmm. after doing my landscape assessment, and I think, okay, like, who are we not seeing? We're not seeing queer and trans people. We certainly are not seeing queer and trans people of color. Um, so I write this first draft. I have 
I mean, I will be really honest here. Um, in this space only, <laughs> uh, I was I was I had a lot of ego that that particular quarter. So I really wanted very little feedback. And it's, I'll be honest, Pose as a pilot was the one and only time ever that I've written a story that where I it just was like living right under the surface of my skin. Yeah. Like it was just waiting to come out. And so I just didn't want to hear anything. Um, and so I wrote that over the course of 10 weeks, um, broke the pilot, broke what I thought would be the, the season, and then executed writing that draft. Mm. And then promptly went out into the industry with it. Um, and was then very quickly told, this is pretty terrible. Um, and so there are two major na networks, who shall remain unnamed, um, who said no, it is no good. Um, and I'm sure they're regretting that now. And then <laughs> I... <laughs> um, but fuck them. So, so it goes out into the industry, they say no, and, and I think, okay, well, there that is. And I, at that point, because the UCLA MFA screenwriting program is structured where if you want, you can stretch it to three years, but it's really a two-year program, and I wrote Pose at the very end of my second year. Uh -huh. And so I really thought, okay, well, this is it. This is the golden ticket. This is, the, this is gonna provide an entree into this industry and that's not what happened. And so I wound up going back to UCLA for a third year with my tail between my legs. That third year in the program, I was constantly talking about this story and I was sending it out to everyone and anyone I knew. Um, and it just, it just kept landing with a thud. And I had enough people who I knew at that point in the industry who were like, you know, I think thought they were giving me great advice. Uh -huh. You know, like I was told by quite a few people, it's really a movie, make it into a feature. And I'm like, no, this is a show. Mm -hmm. It needs, we need more real estate. Like this story cannot be told in two hours. Um, so can I ask, so yes. that was one of the main bits of feedback. As you're hearing no, are they also saying other things as to why no? What were so the other was things you were the, hearing? That first year uh -huh. was just people trying to encourage me. Then I am fortunate enough that internally at UCLA we have a screenwriting competition. And again, for any writers out there, one of the best ways to get your work out into the industry, to create a name for yourself, is to submit to, to competitions. Mm. So I submit uh, the first draft of Pose to our internal UCLA screenwriting competition. It's named an honorable mention, and along with another pilot that I wrote, which won. Oh. So I think the, the one-two punch of having both pilots um, was really helpful. But Pose just circulated everywhere. Mm. And so this pilot that I think was it eight or nine months earlier, people were like, no, thank you. Now suddenly everybody's knocking at my door saying, hey, we would love to meet with you. Oh. And so what Pose did is that it opened up a lot of doors, but it wasn't keeping me in any of those rooms. And what I was hearing at that point, and so this was the last year and a half of the journey prior to meeting Sherry Marsh and Ryan Murphy, um, was it's too queer, it's too trans, it's too black, it's too brown, it's a period piece, and you're a, new, you're a baby writer. And at that point, I had already been staffed on a television show. So again, I'm thinking, well, but I've proven that I can be in a room at this point, and it still was no. Mm -hmm. And you know, I understood, and I certainly didn't believe that as what, the, you know, what we call in the States a baby writer, that someone was gonna pick the script up, read it, and say, let's make that. However, I was hoping that someone would say, we would love to develop it with you. Like, we see that you have a voice, we really see value in this narrative, so let's invest some time and some energy and some money into developing it, and that just wasn't happening. Mm. So while all those conversations are happening, correct me if I'm wrong, but parallel to all of this, Ryan Murphy is also interested in Paris is Burning and he wants to develop that into something. How did the two of you and these two kind of um, parallel projects converge? As I would say, the universe conspires for greatness. Um, I, and, and t as my producing partner and, and dear friend Sherry Marsh says, timing is everything. Although, I don't know how you necessarily gauge that. Um, when I figure out what that is, I'll let everybody know, but... Um, <laughs> I just so happened to have come out of the writer's room on the television show that I was staffed on, and I have a meeting with Sherry Marsh, who is a non-writing executive producer on a show called Vikings, mm. 
um, which in the States airs on uh, History Channel. And so she and I meet, and it's one of those weird meetings where only, this has only really happened twice in my entire career, where you meet someone and immediately you both connect on a really deep spiritual level. Mm -hmm. um, and we just, we talked for two hours and we talked about life and we talked about love and we talked about career. And at the end of it, she said, we have to find something to work on together. Mm -hmm. Little did I know, because up until that point, my team had always used Pose as my lead sample. But they actually had sent her another pilot of mine, that other pilot that I'd written. So I go in there doing the dog and pony show and I start pitching Pose and she's not familiar with it. And I'm like, what did you read? And she hadn't read that, and so I say, you, and she was familiar with the ballroom culture, which was also important, that of the, I don't even know how many executives I met with, part of the issue was that I would always have to go in and do the history lesson before I could even get into talking about story and character, which I think is a unique problem that only women, LGBTQIA+, and people of color ever have to deal with. Yeah. So anyway, um, I go in and I tell her, oh, it's about you know ballroom, and she's like, yeah, I know what that is. And so I'm like, well, great, you should read this pilot. And that happened on a Friday. Monday morning, she reaches out to my team and says, this isn't just a pilot, this is a television show. We need to go out with it immediately. Mm -hmm. And so we then spend about a month and a half crafting a formal pitch. Because um, what I had been doing, I call it pitching, but it was really crude, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and so we spent about a month and a half talking about, you know, what exactly a 30 minute pitch would look like mm. and getting me into a room with high level executives to pitch this show. Yeah. Um, at the same time that that's happening, Ryan Murphy is working on acquiring the rights to Paris is Burning. And so what most folks don't know is that um, Miramax, who was the distributor of Paris is Burning and then Jenny Livingston um, as the filmmaker, really have been very hesitant to sell those rights to develop it into a television show. And I think Ryan Murphy, just being Ryan Murphy, because he's prolific and you know, obviously creates really amazing content, he, along with his producers, um, Color Force, which is Brad Simpson and Nina Jacobson, were working tirelessly to get the rights to the documentary. Mm. And so the week that Sherry and I go out to start pitching Pose, that very week, Jenny says, fine, you can have the rights oh. to Paris is Burning, wow. to Ryan and to his team. Every window opens um, in that very, very serendipitous way. I, I want to ask, um, leaping forward a little, because Pose has really been rightly praised for um, the fact that there's representation, it's not tokenism, it's proper collaboration, it's not just consultation. What were the rules, both in the writer's room, then later on in production and casting, that you all set down in order to make Pose what it is now? Um, well, I think having two of your creators be part of the LGBTQIA plus community means that it's gonna be a pretty damn queer production. Mm -hmm. um, and that there are obviously gonna be lots of trans people involved because it's centering not one but five trans women of color. Um, so that was critically important to us. I know what was really important to me, especially prior to meeting Ryan, was, um, this was always a gotcha question from execs, right? Mm. Was I would go into a meeting and I would pitch the show and immediately people would say, who is supposed to play these characters? And my response was always very defiantly, I don't know because I haven't met them yet. Mm. And you can imagine how that always went over. Um, and Ryan was really the first person who was like, well, yeah, we'd obviously have to go out and cast, cast these women. Like we need to find mm. great trans talent. Um, and again, spoiler alert, there is an abundance of wonderful <laughs> trans talent yeah, out there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, don't believe the hype. Don't buy the rhetoric that there isn't because I think that's something that permeates the industry um, maybe a little less so now because of Pose, but certainly at the time that I was pitching it, it was like, I don't know, I don't know where we're going to find these women. And mm -hmm. it's like, what? Like, you find them the way you find anybody else. Uh -huh. Like, <laughs> it's I'm, literally your job to find them. Hello. Yeah. Um, and so we hired um, Alexa Fogel as our casting director. Um, and she worked on a show called The Wire on HBO. And so she was very familiar with going out and finding nascent talent. Yeah. Um, and so she spent six months. And she and her team were incredible because they actually went out into the ballroom community in New York and they talked to folks and they found incredible talent. 
Um, and I will say, the first draft of the rewritten draft of Pose that I worked on with Ryan Murphy and with Brad Falchuk, we only had three trans women as series regulars on our show. And after meeting with all of the incredible actresses for our show, we then wrote in the characters of Candy and Lulu, mm. specifically for Angelica Ross and for Haley Sahar, because we loved them so much in the audition and we didn't want to lose them. Oh, that's and amazing. that's how three became five. Ah, that's a great story. Um, I want to play a little of the season two trailer soon because um, season one was so spectacular. Season two um, is playing around the world now. But before we do play the trailer, um, I want to ask, in terms of like stepping back, um, all those kind of macro, bigger conversations about representation versus tokenism, um, collaboration versus consultation, um, agency rather than appearance. Uh, how do you ensure those things come to fruition and what, I mean, you know, on a basic level, why are they so important within the context of the LGBTIQA plus community and whether it's queer people of colour and people of colour? That's a big question. Yeah. Um, do we have another hour? <laughs> it, here's the thing. Um, it, this is a simple notion, but the truth is representation matters. And it's simple and it is the truth. Um, there are enough studies that have been done to show that film and television absolutely can impact things like self-esteem, for example. So it is critically important to be able to see yourself and to not just base those narratives in our traumas. Mm. Because the reality is, and I, for me, this was what was most important about Pose, is that we're moving past the trauma. You know, that trans lives matter, and trans bodies are so much more than just their traumas. Mm. And so it's about celebrating the fullness of a life, um, you know, I think when we talk about representation specifically, though, it can be representation for the sake of representation because that's still tokenism. And so I think one of the things that we often talk about in the States is, you know, we're missing a, you know, we're missing a, a LGBTQ person of color, you know, um, we're missing a woman. And so we're just going to throw one in and think that that's enough. And it isn't, you know, like that isn't enough. Like you completely just tokenize an entire group of people. Mm. And so it's about, and I'm gonna take this a step further because really up until I would say, like just a few minutes ago, I always felt that it was enough for us to just have a seat at the table. Yeah. Um, and that has really shifted for me in the last year. And at this point, I now feel, I don't want to have a seat at the table when I have to fight to get that seat. I'd rather take a step back and take a little more time and do the hunting and gathering that's necessary to get the tools that I need to just build my own damn table. Mm. You know? um, and, I, and I recognize though that I'm afforded a lot of privileges being here that I have the ability to say that, right? Mm. So I think it's important for us to once again locate where we stand, right? Like, what is our position? Like, I'm still male and I'm still cisgendered, right? So I cannot navigate the life in this, oh, woe is me place because I'm a person of color and because I'm queer. Like, I'm not gonna get anywhere. And it's like, girl, you still have a lot of privileges, you know, being male, yeah. being cis. And so um, I think it's just important that we all take stock in where we locate ourselves. Um, to go back to the, something you asked earlier, though, because I think it's just, it's something that's been marinating me in my brain for a while, and I just want to make sure that I say this, which is I also think when we're talking about representation and inclusion, we tend to talk about it in a very um, micro way, yeah. right? And so we end up just putting Band-Aids on gunshot wounds. Oh, we're missing people, so let's just fill in those spots with a couple of you know, queer or trans people or women or, or, or folks of color. Um, and I would really implore all of you I think it behooves all of us to just take a step back and look at this from a more macro perspective. So just for example, you know, we cannot have women in the industry directing if we're not encouraging women to direct. You know, so go out there and find young girls and instead of giving them a tea set, maybe give them a camera. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. Like um I just think about, 
the, the resources that were given to me, again, at 15, when I was in that after school program. And so I think, you know, find young people who don't know that they ha have a voice and that their voice is important and that their voice matters and encourage them to write, encourage them to direct, encourage them to produce. Um, I think that, you know, and that's, I wanna acknowledge that what I'm saying in some ways maybe doesn't acknowledge that there are plenty of women and LGBTQ people and people of color right now who absolutely are doing this work and haven't been given the privileges that I've been given, so I recognize that. Um, but the reality is I think that we, we just aren't encouraging folks from marginalized communities enough. And so, um, you know, what's really important to me is, is using whatever free time I have to volunteer. So for example, in Los Angeles, I volunteer at a women's shelter um, with young girls who have been part of the foster care system and we spend several weekends with them, you know, teaching them about writing and producing and directing and then they craft their own short films and then we screen those films at Sony, Sony Pictures lot um, in Hollywood. And, um, you know, I think that, and I don't say that as like a pat on my back for doing great work, I'm saying that because hopefully some of those girls, if not all of them, will then say, I absolutely have the ability to go out there and to create. Yeah. We're talking about creating, we're talking about building. Before we go to audience questions, thank you so much. Oh, great. Um, we have, uh, let's look at what you've built, which is season two of Pose. Let's play the trailer now. <laughs> My God, Stephen. I mean, what a beautiful synthesis of history, queerness, and love right there. I mean, I love those actors so, so yeah, much. Too. Thank you for bringing them to us. Thank you for getting those stories on the screen. Um, we're gonna have some audience questions now. Okay, so the first question is, can we see a clip? There you go, there's your answer. <laughs> the second question is, what can inclusivity do better to bolster and encourage more LGBT plus creators to tell their stories? I feel like we've answered that a little, so if you wanna park that, there's another question here as well. How do we shift conversation about diversity away from cis white feminist gender struggles towards further gender diversity issues, particularly for trans folk? I feel like those questions speak to each other. So maybe do you wanna tackle both of them yeah. in tandem? It's funny because there's an exhibit right now in the Octa Museum um, around Gorilla Girls, mm -hmm. um, which is great. And I was just talking about this with my partner. I think that Again, we don't have enough time to unpack it all here yeah. right now. Um, you know, I think, and this is, again, this is very crude and this is simple, but um, we need to shift our ideologies and recognize that, you know, trans folks, non-binary folks, that, you know, their lives, again, matter. Mm -hmm. um, when we're talking about trans women, that they are women. Um, you know, that we need to be thinking about intersectionality. Mm -hmm. That's really, truly, like, the simplest way. You know, we, we more often than not are, we're talking about things like feminism, for example, at the exclusion of some, mm -hmm. um, and not recognizing that while there certainly is a place to talk about a community monolithically, mm -hmm. um, that there are nuances to experiences depending on what your other identities are. Mm. Um, and so, and, and really and truthfully, like I'm not a fan of talking about communities as a monolith, because I just think it's wildly problematic. Um, and as someone who lives in the intersection, I understand that, but I think, you know, case in point, which is on our show, right, we have two trans women um, which is, I guess, historic for any writer's room in Hollywood, in, in Our Lady J and Janet Mock. Mm -hmm. And Janet Mock is a, trans, a black trans woman from Hawaii, mm -hmm. and Our Lady J is a white trans woman from Pennsylvania. You know? And they have very specific experiences, and they don't always agree on everything mm -hmm. you know, when we're talking about our show and our characters. And I think you know, that's the thing that we need to recognize and acknowledge, right? That that you know, if we're talking about a community, for example, the LGBTQIA plus community, mm -hmm. you know, that if you happen to be a person who is differently abled, you know, if you come from a different uh, class or socioeconomic background, you know, a different race, that that 
dramatically impacts the experience that you are having. Mm. Um, and that, that's such a specific story that needs to be told in and of itself. I, 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 one of the things that I really get from Pose when I watch it is, is how you lean into the specifics rather than as much as it is a queer story and a story about LGBTIQA+, it's also about, well, well let's, this is tea. You know, let's, let's really centre transgender people um, at the heart of the story because we have to also acknowledge that within minority communities there are minorities within minorities. And here's the thing, like I'm not a, an academic and I certainly don't think of myself as like an intellectual or a thought leader by any means, right? So there are people out there who are certainly doing the work, who are coming out of the academy and who are writing really interesting and, and intelligent pieces about what we are or what I very clearly am discussing. Um, you know, I think when it comes to sort of the revolutionary act of a show like Pose, the reality is, I feel in many ways, like we've just fooled our audience because at the end of the day, Pose really and truly is just a family drama. You know, I think the only thing that we've done is just that we've centered people that you've never ever seen before. That's the only thing that's revolutionary about Pose. Mm -hmm. You know, because if you were to take these characters and you were to make them white or straight or cis or all three, you know, it would still just be a family drama. Yeah. Like, we've seen this narrative before. Mm. You've seen it a million times. The mm. only difference is that we've centered it. We just took the, the spotlight and we went, eh, and yeah. we just moved it to a whole different set of people. Mm. That's all. We've got one question. Let's take it personal now. Um, this is a great question. As an 18-year-old Maori student, first year of university, um, I struggle to recognize my individual voice. Mm. How do you navigate finding your own voice through the noise of other artists? Um, I would say be okay with... Hmm, let me rewind and think about how I want to phrase this. Mm. And I mean, part of me thinks that, is there any advice that you would give to a younger version of yourself when you were starting writing out? Because we've got someone here who's 18 years old, starting out university. To, to actually locate what your voice actually is and what you want to say is one of the biggest challenges, right? Like it was there all along, mm -hmm. but how do you refine that and convey it through your craft? I mean, if we're using me as the case study here, I would say it's okay for you to take some time and not know the answer to that question, right? Like I think we all navigate life as if there's this rule book mm -hmm. that's getting passed around that says there's a marker and by this point in your life or by this age you need to have hit this moment and it's like, but really there isn't one, right? Like that's just, that's all cultural. Like we've all sort of created these rules and, and passed them down for generations and they don't actually exist. So it's okay that you're 18 and you don't know. And if anything, uh, in the words of, of um, oh, I'm gonna blank on the character, I, I forget the character's name, but from uh, Angels in America, mm -hmm. blanking on the character's name now, but um, the line is, sometimes lost is best, go exploring. And so I think it's okay, like allow yourself the time that you need to just explore and like live a life, you know? So like fall in love, have your heart broken, you know, fall, make a mistake, like let all of those things that are natural and real to life, mm. allow those things to happen because A, it's gonna make the, the work that much more interesting. Yeah. Well, Stephen Canals, thank you so much for exploring and sharing what you've found along the way. Could you please join me in thanking the wonderful one and only Stephen Canals, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.